keep the home fires burning, good sir. We beat them before, we'll do it again. Mysteries have done quite well for this channel in the past, and in this present moment, we need to dip our toes back into the unsolved, the unexplained, the unimaginable. But this time with a twist. World War II was perhaps the most decisive moment in human history, probably the most talked about too. When pure evil threatened to take over the world, the bravest men, women and children of all time had to stand their ground and sacrifice everything. Now you're watching this video because either you like my content or you're interested in the deepest World War II mysteries and I will guarantee you dear viewer that there are mysteries here in abundance. You're going to enjoy this one. But lest it be said that I'm not a World War II expert, I did alright in history at school but I am by no means an expert so if I get anything wrong please let me know down in the comments but just try to be nice and sane about it. Anyway, without further ado, this is the deepest World War II mysteries iceberg explained. The Lost Gold Train. So that's what we're starting off with here. So there is a legend in Polish folklore that the Axis hid a train filled with gold and treasure down in the tunnels or mines of southwest Poland during the final days of the war. Now whether this train is true or false, whether it's a mere myth or a true tale is unknown because if there is a train, it hasn't been found yet. Even despite the Polish state excavating many times. As recently as 2015, the Poles have still been digging, looking for this hidden treasure, but they've come up short, largely because this is a rumor and what they're looking for might not exist. But it's a very, very famous piece of folklore. Whether it's true or whether it's false, that still remains to this day a mystery. So we're starting off a bit general because next up we have MIA soldiers, missing in action soldiers, which is simply guessing at the fact that throughout the war, many soldiers went missing and it's hard to know where. The USA had nearly 80,000 men and women go missing during the course of the war, which accounted for about 20% of its reported deaths. That is a lot of people. So the question is, where are they? I mean, it's fair to say that most of them died, whether it be on land or in the skies, most likely in the seas, most of them would have died. However, it's not out of the realm of possibility that a few of them got out alive and perhaps just started a new life. I mean, a lot of the bodies were just unrecognizable after being blown to smithereens, so a lot of people just couldn't be identified, but maybe perhaps some of them just deserted. I don't think in World War II it was that common, but perhaps maybe one or two of them would have survived but even still there's not too much more to discuss with this because it's just very general so let's move on. Speaking of missing, Heinrich Müller was the chief of the Gestapo for the majority of the war. If you don't know who the Gestapo were, they were the secret police within Germany so this dude was one of the highest ranking officials and one of Hitler's right hand men and just like Hitler, we don't know where he is. Now, we can assume that Hitler died in 1945, but whilst we can say that, we have no clue about Müller. The day after Hitler is reported to have died, Müller is quoted as saying, We know the Russian methods exactly. I haven't the faintest intention of being taken prisoner by the Russians. That day, the 1st of May 1945, was the last time anyone ever saw Muller, leaving him to become the highest ranking official whose fate is a mystery. Everyone else we can make a guess for, and while it's likely that Muller died, there isn't really any concrete evidence for this claim. We have no idea where he went. There is not a semblance of a clue. Some say he defected to the Soviets. Others think that he was buried in a mass grave. He and his fate is really an enigma. Jean Moulin was the first president of the National Council of the Resistance from the 23rd of May 1943 until his death less than two months later. Very important for French unity, he's credited as being one of France's biggest heroes throughout the war. Now, being the leader of the French resistance was a dangerous job and unfortunately it wouldn't last long because on the 21st of June 1943, Moulin was arrested after a meeting with fellow resistant leaders at the home of Dr. Frédéric Dujon. Apologies if I've mispronounced any of these names so far because I'm going to do it throughout the video. Anyways, here's the thing. This was actually a very private affair, making many suspicious that he was actually betrayed by one of his closest confidants. The man was tortured and killed by Klaus Barbie shortly after, known as the Butcher of Lyon. Theories of his betrayer range from communists to the man who is generally regarded as the prime suspect, René Hardy, who was arrested by the Gestapo at the house in Calerie-Ecrie. 
but he was able to either escape or was allowed to flee, so that was very suspicious at the time. However, in two post-war trials that looked at his role in the arrest, Hardy was acquitted for lack of evidence. Whoever it was, the likelihood is that they would have been considered as very close to Moulin because they knew his exact whereabouts, which would have been very private knowledge due to his position. So for that reason, even today, it remains an unsolved mystery. We need to continue down this betrayal line with the question, who betrayed Anne Frank? This question still plagues historians to this day because on August 4th, 1944, the hidden attic was stormed by German police, capturing the Franks and the Van Pels. It goes without saying that Anne Frank was a Jewish girl hiding from the Germans with her family, along with another, the Van Pels. During her time in hiding, she wrote a diary, and it's probably the most famous diary of all time, just in case the small chance that you didn't know her. Now, here's the thing. When they were captured, it was a storming by the police. It wasn't someone that just so happened to check the building and find them. This leads people to believe that someone knew about those hiding in the attic and they snitched on them. To be brief, there are three major suspects that include Lena van Bladeren, Hartog, who worked at the stockroom below Frank. She was thought to have been extremely afraid of the consequences if she was found to be concealing Jews, and apparently the theory is that she did it out of fear. As well as her, we have Willem van Maren. Maren was the manager of the warehouse the attic was attached to. Apparently the guy was very slimy and very sly, and even criticised him in her diary, so it's definitely within the realms of possibility. He also told his co-worker Lamert Hartog that he knew about the hiding families in May or June 1944, about two months before they were arrested. Finally, Tony Arlers was a Dutch Nazi and he was the third suspect. Allegedly, he knew that the families were hiding there the entire time. He was first acquainted with Otto Frank in 1941, who he tried to blackmail after the war ended, so he's absolutely a suspect because of his evil nature. Though there are three, my money would definitely be on one of the last two, but to this day, we just don't know who did it. It could have been any of them. It could have been anyone else. It's unlikely, but they could have just stumbled upon them, so maybe they weren't ratted out, maybe they were. If they were, who was it? We just don't know. It's a mystery, it's unsolved, and it's unknown. Hitler's globe is a missing object that was designed for the Führer himself. Now the globe that we're talking about would be normal, but some of the countries that were autonomous, there were changes made that the Axis wanted to see happen. For example, it changed Abyssinia, or today's Ethiopia, to Italian East Africa. The globe itself was measured at 1.2 meters by 1.7 meters, so absolutely huge. So why is this on the World War II mysteries? Well, the whereabouts of the globe are unknown to this day. This was one of Hitler's prized possessions, and it's interesting that it's now gone. Now, Hitler didn't own just one globe. It's actually thought that he owned many, one of which was actually found by John Barsamian, an American soldier who took it home with him, stating that most of what was inside Hitler's countryside home, which was where he found the globe, was actually ransacked by the time he got there. Another one found actually contained a bullet hole inside Germany, thought to be done by either Soviet or American soldiers. As for the biggest one, we don't know. It's seen as a symbol of Hitler's desire for world conquest, and so it would be nice to find it, but as of yet, we haven't because it's been seized or destroyed. Raoul Wallenberg served as Sweden's special envoy in Budapest between July and December 1944. In this position, Wallenberg issued protective passports and sheltered Jews in buildings designated as Swedish territory, and it's known that Wallenberg helped save the lives of thousands of Jews. He is one of the greatest men of the war. However, by putting the lives of the Jews before his own, he was a wanted man. On the 17th of January 1945, during the siege of Budapest by the Red Army, on suspicion of espionage, Wallenberg subsequently disappeared. The siege was brought on by Rodion Malinowski, a Russian marshal. Wallenberg's last recorded words were, I'm going to Malinowski's. Whether as a guest or a prisoner, I do not know yet. As it turns out, it was unfortunately a prisoner because Wallenberg was never seen by the public again. We think that he died in 1947 because that's when the Soviets reported his death in a report actually released in 1957. Even still, with the amount of secrecy within the Soviet Union, especially right after the war, some people don't believe them despite it being generally agreed upon. Some people think that he was imprisoned for life, with the last reported sighting of him happening in 1987. But 
Anyways, he was declared legally dead in 2016 and it's a shame that we'll never actually know what happened to this hero because he was just an amazing man. So good in fact that he was granted honorary citizenship of Canada, Hungary, Australia, Israel and the USA. How did Hermann Göring get cyanide? I think I've actually realised that most entries on this list are just important individuals and how they got captured or died. Hermann Göring's case is definitely one of the more interesting ones though because Göring was a military leader and one of the most powerful men in the Axis. Well, at least at the beginning of the war he was because at the end he just went around stealing Jewish art. The reason for this is because his relationship with Hitler soon diminished after Germany started losing the war. This led us to 1945 in which Hitler allegedly said that he had made plans to commit suicide. Göring requested that he take control of the Third Reich and Hitler saw this as treason, removing Göring of all positions and ordering his arrest. In the end, Göring was captured by the Allies and was convicted at the Nuremberg Trials in 1946. The decision was that he was to be put to death by hanging. He had requested to be shot but was denied. They wanted to see him hang. This never happened however as Göring died by ingesting cyanide just hours before he was meant to get hanged. The question is, who did it? How did he get the cyanide? So there are a few theories here, the biggest of which was that a US guard claimed to have accidentally given Goring a vial of what he thought was medicine, but was actually cyanide. He was manipulated by a woman by the name of Mona, and it's also been revealed that Goring had been planning taking cyanide for a while. He took multiple vials of cyanide from Germany, one of which potentially he hid up his butt. He didn't want to go out by hanging, thinking that it would bring shame upon Germany, but the method that he eventually got the cyanide is still not confirmed, even if there are more likely possibilities such as the medicine mix-up. MI6 and the occult. So this one, let's bear in mind that World War II was a weird time. In the space of 30 years, we went from the first tanks being introduced to the nuclear bomb, okay? That's how good we got at killing each other within a single generation. So the fact that MI6 the secret intelligence service of the UK hired Cecil Williamson to become the founder of the Witchcraft Research Centre might not be too out there. It literally says on Wikipedia, right? Williamson, occupation, MI6 operative, witch. Like, what? Anyways, in 1938, MI6 hired Williamson to investigate the opposition's occult interests, and in doing so, he formed the Witchcraft Research Centre. An April 1944 news report, while not mentioning the Witchcraft Research Centre, reflects their area of expertise in claiming that Joseph Goebbels was going to harness fortune-telling, astrology, and necromancy to his propaganda machine. The Axis were up to stuff, and Cecil was the only man to try and counter their witchcraft. Only thing was, as far as the world is aware, there isn't any such thing as witchcraft, but perhaps there was. Williamson's close friend Gerald Gardner was actually a Wiccan, and within his coven, called the New Forest Coven, he actually performed a ritual called Operation Cone of Power, hoping that it would influence the High Command of Germany not to attack the UK. During this ritual is reported that many of the older, frailer witches began dying soon after. Apparently this is because they had to perform the ritual naked and some of them caught pneumonia. But who knows, it could have been a supernatural force demanding a sacrifice. Unlikely, but it could be. The witchcraft department isn't well documented. Could they be hiding stuff? Probably not, but we will never know. It's an unsolved, unsolved mystery that. And finally we have, what did Werner Heisenberg and Niels Bohr talk about in Copenhagen. So I need to try and simplify this as much as I can. There is so much to speak about in regards to these two, but from what I've interpreted, and I might have got this wrong, so again, please let me know in the comments if I did misinterpret anything. Long story short, Heisenberg and Boer were two of the most intelligent men during the war. They knew each other previously, and in 1941, the two met again in Copenhagen. You see, prior to this, Boer had been a mentor to Heisenberg. He influenced his work and studies. That was back in the 20s, and this was 1941. In 1941, the two were actually on opposing sides of the war, with Boer on the side of the Allies, and Heisenberg working for the Axis. He wasn't a Nazi, mind you. He actually tried to hire a Jewish person to work at the University of Leipzig in the 1930s, but he was, in fact, a German nationalist. Boer, on the other hand, was probably the complete opposite. He actually helped German refugees trying to escape the country. Now, when they met in Copenhagen, this was worlds colliding because the two hadn't seen each other in some time because of the war. When they met, 
Heisenberg was appointed leader within the German nuclear program. Now, this was 1941, and let's be fair, in 1941, a betting man may have well put their money on the Axis reigning supreme. Europe had been nearly obliterated, and only the UK and Soviets stood in the way of a German victory. Heisenberg is reported to have said to Boer that they should join forces, as a Hitler victory was seemingly assured, but Boer was less inclined to believe this. From what I can imagine, and I really am no historian, I'm just reading this fantastic article about their meeting, which I will link in the description. You should definitely read it, because it's fantastic. But what happened next was one of the biggest games of mental chess the world has ever seen. Again, Heisenberg wasn't a Nazi, but he did want to see Germany win the war. Boer, on the other hand, now knowing that Heisenberg was the head of the nuclear weapons program, needed to make sure that he didn't reveal his hand, because he knew that the Allies were also planning a nuclear bomb, but he couldn't let on that he knew too much. This worked out extremely well in his favour though, because Heisenberg, in an attempt to prove that a nuclear bomb was feasible, gave over a drawing to Boa, which we'll get onto later. Their conversation is said to have ended on a sour note, with Boa getting angrier and angrier. And then, in 1943, when word had gotten to Boa that he was about to get arrested, the British smuggled Boa out of Denmark, after which he gave a drawing that Heisenberg had given him to the USA, which helped with their nuclear weapons program. Heisenberg had accidentally committed an act of treason. Heisenberg was later captured by the Allies at the end of the war, and apparently was supportive of the Allies using the atomic bomb. By this point, due to the Axis losing the war, less funding and attention was given to its nuclear weapons program, and it fell drastically behind. Some people think that Heisenberg eventually came to his senses and sabotaged the efforts, but others disagree. Even after the war, the student and mentor were never able to repair their relationship, disagreeing on the most basic of scientific fundamentals. Now, it's impossible to know what was said during this meeting, but to be honest, I'm impressed we know as much as we did, because this meeting was indicative of political ideologies and science clashing. I don't know, this kind of thing is just extremely fascinating to me, because these were just the greatest minds in the world having at it in a battle of science and intelligence and philosophy and politics. It must have been a very interesting debate. But anyways, that's it from me. I know this video is quite different to the normal type, but I'm very glad to see a historical iceberg winning for once. If you enjoyed the video, please do subscribe. We're coming up to 7k now, and we'd love to have you as a part of the community. Follow me on all of my socials. That's Instagram, Twitter, Twitch, all at FoxAkimbo, and all in the description. Support me on Patreon. Speaking of which, a massive shout out to Chris M and Cage101101. These two legends are my patrons and I love them. Send iceberg charts to foxakimbo at gmail.com for a chance to be featured in a future video. This specific iceberg chart that I sampled today was made by Angel124126, so shout out to Angel. Finally, let me know down in the comments what you'd like to see me do next, as I'm only 51 videos in and I'm already out of ideas. Thank you for watching.